Please remain on the line. The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to our review of the camp County Capacity Planning Reporting for SB 1383, the first of which of these reports is due this year on August 1st. Today we'll be walking you through the uh, reporting screens and then we'll do some Q&A. Just a little housekeeping here at the beginning. My name is Chris Bria. Uh, you may remember me from the previous year webinars we've conducted the last couple weeks, as well as the year webinars from the last few years. Right now, you'll see a disclaimer on the screen going over some basic information as far as we're using testing data. Nothing in here is real. Anything that we save is not saved for real. Um, this is just for advice and information. Uh, nothing in this is actually happening. It's all going to be test information. After each section that we cover, we're going to be opening up a Q&A session. If you're in the GoToWebinar during the presentations, feel free to put anything into the questions pane. We will be answering those either written or we will turn on your mic and answer them verbally if you'd like to ask them. Uh, we'll be doing that after each couple of sections. First off, we're going to go over some login info. Then Andrew's going to take over and show the report screens, and then we'll open it up to whatever else people would like to ask. Too, too far. Okay, so first up, we have login information. On, go away, go to meeting. So when the report is released, uh, we're hoping it is tomorrow. The recipients of the release message will be the SLCP of primary and official contacts, as noted on the April 1st initial jurisdiction compliance report. Those are the only contacts it will be released to. There will be a login uh, piece included in that message. And if you did not turn in an April 1 report prior to, I believe it was last Monday, Friday, or previous Friday, uh, so, so if it was not turned in prior to last week, then it will be defaulting to the unincorporated county's primary annual report contact. There will be instructions in the release message that you can review if you need to add other people. This is a county-based report, so therefore only county contacts should be getting access. If for some reason you need other people to access it, there are instructions for that in the report. To access the report, you will need a web pass. If you are listed as a county primary or official contact, a web pass invite would have been sent to you automatically when you were added as a contact to the county uh, last Monday, I believe. Yeah, it was last Monday and there were a handful last Tuesday as well. So if you don't have a web pass, you can have one pre-created and when we you know, reset your security rights, it'll add you in. Or if you already had one, you should have got received a notice saying that you already have a web pass available. If you need to create a web pass or update your password information or resend the activation email, you can do that from the web pass screen here. And when you go to log into the report, you can also press the web pass button on the screen. Now I'm going to log in to the report. Okay. 
And when you log in as a county user, you will only see the jurisdictions and counties that you have access to. Uh, in this case, for testing purposes, this account is set up for multiple reports, though you are most likely, if you're only a county reporter and the primary official, you may only be seeing a link to just the county reports here on the right side. This left-hand column that says jurisdictions is specific to the electronic annual report. The county capacity planning report for this year will be located in this list on the right side. So with that, we will pause for questions and then I will hand it over to Andrew. We don't have any questions so far, so we'll just go right to Andrew. All right, let me pass that back off. Thanks, Chris. Just thought I'd show my face for a moment while we transition presenting functionality, and I'm going to turn it back off so you can see the screen more better. Okay. Um, so advancing from the previous screen that Chris just showed, you open up this as you click on your county. And again, just as a reminder, even though we're using Contra Costa County, it's just for demonstration purposes, not actual information uh, that you're about to see. Uh, so you will access your county capacity plan and report in this top box. Specifically, you're going to click on 2022 to 2024 to access your report. Um, I guess just to show you on this screen, after you submit your report, you can select this drop down and pick that report to download a PDF version as well. First, uh, as soon as you access your report, it opens up a contact information screen to edit these details. And this is just for who's submitting the report. You have the back and edit buttons. Uh, these are the exact same back and edit buttons down at the bottom. Click edit, enter your information of who's filling out the report. And this is just in case we have questions or need to clarify any of your answers um, on the next screen uh, we know who to get a hold of to ask those questions once you update that information click save you can click on the tabs across the top to advance to the next page or here you can follow the breadcrumbs as well It both take you to the same spot so kick on click on capacity plan and reporting loads the screen I have it broken into the two tables organic waste capacity and edible food recovery capacity to access the grids themselves you click edit on the top of the page and then you click edit within the grid then it kind of opens up what we call the form entry screen enter the estimated organic waste for landfill disposal in tons the organic waste recycling capacity verify will be available in tons, the needed organic waste recycling capacity in tons. And then if uh, you've identified any proposed new or expanded recycling facilities that could be used to process the jurisdictions generated organic waste, on this drop down, you say yes, which activates the text box. And then in this text box, you can identify those locations so by address or jurisdiction or a description that you feel is fit to pro appropriately identify those uh, facilities or locations and as example you can type whatever characters you want in here something along those lines and then you're done with this section all right so these next two sections i'm just going to scroll down real fast to show you the whole thing if you have two identical kind of jurisdiction selection areas that are asking two different questions the first one you're identifying those jurisdictions that are required to submit an implementation schedule due to insufficient organic waste recycling capacity the way this part of the report works um, and again um, over on this side, this will only populate with the jurisdictions for your county. So we're in Contra Costa County, so it's showing all Contra Costa County jurisdictions associated in the logic system. 
you can pick one and move them over. Well, here, let me first, let me remove all those so we can start clean. You can pick one and select to move them over. If you want to pick multiple, you can click and hold down control and kind of pick and choose. Or you can click and drag to highlight them all and move them that way as well. So for demonstration purposes, I'll just select a few random few. That answers this first question. Second question, identify each jurisdiction that did not provide any information regarding organic waste recycling capacity to the county within the required 120-day time frame. And this works the same as the grid I just showed you above. So I'll clear those out. You select all that may apply and move them over. As soon as you're done, you click Save. And then it updates that record in the top grid. Edible food recovery capacity operates the same way. Click the same. Same questions, but associated with edible food recovery capacity. We can say the same thing. Whatever it may be. And then the same questions apply specific to edible food recovery capacity. So the first grid is asking jurisdictions within the county that are required to submit an implementation schedule. Again, we can clear these out. Click remove. Select all those that may apply. Move them over. And then our second question. Identify each jurisdiction that not provide any information regarding edible food recovery capacity to the county within the required 100 day, 120 day time frame. Again, select that to remove that. Hold down control to select multiple entries that are not next to each other. Select to move them over. When you're done with that, click Save. You now completed both sections of the report kind of indicated by the green check mark up here. You want to click Save on that page to record those entries. And then you can click Submit Confirmation here or Submit conf Confirmation at the top to actually submit the report. The Summary Report button is the same as I showed you on the first page with the dropdown. It'll take a second to load here in staging, but I'll show you what it looks like. Depending on your browser, Edge, it pops up up here. I think Chrome, it pops up down in the lower left. You can open that file. And this is what the PDF version will look like. Because of the size of the grids, it just splits it up into three different rows. But you have your organic waste re recycling capacity and then the start of the edible food recovery capacity down here. And that's just what you input on those grids. As soon as everything's done, you click Submit Capacity Planning Report down at the bottom. You get a warning to make sure you do want to. You can say OK. And at this point, you should get a confirmation email um, saying that you submitted your report properly. And with that, I'll pause to see if there's any questions on capacity planning and reporting. We have a couple questions just on um, general info on the webinar. Can you just remind everybody when and where the webinar will be posted later on and who the target audience is? Uh, yes, the webinar will be recorded. Sorry about that. Uh, that was the confirmation email saying I submitted my report. Um, but yes, the webinar will be recorded. We will. Um, when we figure out the location of the report, whether it be with the reporting or capacity planning, we'll send out an SLCP listserv message indicating where this recording can be found. And the target of today's webinar is specifically for counties. All jurisdictions within counties provide this information to the counties, and then only the county is reporting to CalRecycle.
The next question is coming from Corin Heisler, and they ask, do we need to upload our verification documents for the organic recycling facilities? Uh, you are unmuted on our end. You can um, unmute yourself if there's anything you want to add. Nothing to add. I'm just wondering if we need to upload verification for the organic recycling capacity. Not as part of this capacity planning report. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Jeff Johnson. If you update contact info, does this person become the new main contact moving forward or only for this report? Chris, can you ask, answer that question, please? Yeah, that's really just uh, to know who is the person who filled it out and submitted it, because there could be, as I mentioned right now, the only people who will have access to it once it opens are the SLCP designated primary and official contacts, as noted on the initial jurisdiction compliance report. We may end up adding other people if the county requests. So really that, that field is to know who did this, because there could be one person that has access, there could end up being five. So it's important for us to know who is actually submitting it. The uh, primary and official contacts will remain the same unless we get you know, a request to update them. But most of those, I mean, they were just submitted in the last couple of months. I do know one person that turned it in and has since retired. So we do have one to update, but it wasn't for a county. Okay, the next question is from Trishna Robinson. They are asking if you could um, explain how to know who from the county has access to the web pass. Uh, you can reach out to us individually and we can give you that information. Send, send a request to the logic inbox, L-O-G-I-C at calrecycle.ca.gov because we, we added contacts to the county report uh, web pass invites would have been automatically generated when they were added, but some people have firewalls up, so they may not have gotten them. Some people may have already had a web pass. So, you know, web pass is one thing, access to the report is different. So send send a request to the logic mailbox, L-O-G-I-C at calrecycle.ca.gov, and we can let you know who we added and whether or not they have completed their web pass activation. We will go ahead and put that um, that link in the chat. Our next question is from Sam Dickinson from Santa Barbara County. Um, they state some of our entities that reported information to us for the capacity planning report provided incorrect information. Is it up to the county to request information again? It is up to the county to report on the capacity planning for two calorie cycles. So if you feel it's incorrect, then I'd probably follow up on it. We won't be following up with individual jurisdictions unless you indicate that they need to submit an implementation schedule to us. The next question from Ellen Law, they ask, how much quality assurance on data received from jurisdictions is required of the county? Uh, there's no record keeping requirements or records to be submitted along with the report. Hey, Andrew, I'd like to add, this is Kara. Um, on that question, you know, we've gone over, counties are responsible for collecting the data from each individual jurisdiction that's located in the county. Um, there's not an expectation for the county to do a quality control or review that data. Um, you are relying, each jurisdiction has its own responsibility to follow the regulatory requirements. If you have a question, however, and you're kind of wondering, um, please feel free to contact your land liaison and we can set up a, a, a phone call and talk through the issue and see what we can do to assist. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Kara. Thank you for that, Kara. Um, our next question is from Lynn Paul. When I logged in to see the Welcome to uh, Local Government Information Center, they're not seeing the capacity report, um, capacity planning report 
submit confirmation page. Is that an issue anyone else is experiencing? So well, before we I, get I, there, I Andrew, go um, ahead. First off, Lynn, you were you are attached to the city of Desert Hot Springs in Riverside County. So as a city contact, you would not have access to this report unless Riverside County submitted a request to give you access. So that is specifically why you are not seeing anything on that page at this time. But your web pass is active, so you are able to log in. That's a good sign. And then I just want to add on to for the counties on the call, we have not released the county capacity planning report yet. We are hoping to do so in the next few days. We're not seeing any more questions uh, for Neil. They stepped out. The target audience for this was for the counties. And we. Yes, I answered that in the chat. The this is a county report submitted by the counties. Uh, cities are more than welcome to be watching this, so they kind of know what the counties will be doing. Um, and I, once again, that that report, the the jurisdiction, the cities, special collection districts, on incorporated county, all need to supply this information to the county, and then they are submitting a co compiled report that covers the entire county. And we do have another question. This is from TJ Carter. They say, as noted in the requirements, jurisdictions must identify the amount in tons of existing organic waste recycling infrastructure capacity located both in the county and outside of the county that is verifiably available to the jurisdiction. Uh, since the SBWMA is a regional agency in only a portion of the county, their agency's capacity infrastructure is on behalf of their jurisdictions collectively. They're unsure about how to provide this for data for organics capacity planning to the county. Uh, I can unmute them and then if they want to unmute themselves to add more. Yeah, I'll just add hey, Esmeralda, before, before we make mute, unmute them. Um, I think this is a pretty specific question that um, I think warrants a follow up. Um, call and meeting. So I'd like to turn it to Andrew and, and see what he thinks. But this is kind of a nuanced one um, where we could talk through the process and what's needed. Uh, but the big picture is the regional agency could provide the data um, if they've been designated to do so. They could provide that data to the county so that the county can roll it up into their, their report. I was going to suggest the same thing. We do have one more question if you just want to um, speak to how much quality assurance is going to be expected of the counties. This question is from Ellen Law. I mean, as far as the reporting is concerned, I'll just go back to it. I believe I'm still sharing my screen. It's just the quality assurance. Oh, sorry, this is a bug we identified. Hold on just a second. I'll get back to actual data. You won't have this issue when you edit your report. Um, so it's, we're just, it's kind of an estimation to check that the amount of organic waste that's being generated is also being uh, recycled and then the plan is in place if there's a shortfall of what facilities will be needed to cover that organics recycling capacity. And I'll reemphasize that what's on the screen right now is not real and it clearly doesn't make any sense. Um, but this is just for example purposes. So don't necessarily take what you see on here as you know, real answers because if you look at the, the numbers put in that it doesn't really add up. So, and the num when after the data is submitted, we will be looking at it to make sure it does make sense. If we still have time from one, we do have one question that came into the SLCP inbox. Yep, we have another five minutes or so before we want to show another part, and then we'll have another Q&A portion after that next presentation as well. 
Okay, we'll go ahead and get to this one from Allison Burley then uh, from Aurora Environmental Incorporated. Could the PDF version be made available in black and white rather than the green background background with white print? Um, not everyone has a color printer or would like to waste that much ink. Uh, you should be able to change those settings uh, when you go to print it on your end. And we do have one request from Sadie Caldas asking if we can please show the edible food reporting page again. Sure. Oh, <laughs> kind of. I can show you this part because I already submitted it. It's going to take me during the next presentation. I'll set up another one so that I can access the function of this grid. But this is all I can show you at the moment. Um, but if you wait until after we show you the calculators, I can get back into the grid itself and show it to you again. One more question from Rosemary, Rosemary Radford. For materials like remainder, compost, organic, or sorry, composite, organic, non-compostables, where jurisdictions aren't able to divert, we have been filling in other, but don't have a facility, so it shows a small deficit in capacity. Is this intended, and how should we handle this? Um, I say that we'll follow up with you outside of this presentation, Rosemary, to talk about your particular situation. Andrew, I think a question that got kind of rolled over because a few very long ones came in. Can you jump back to the external logic screen? Someone wanted to see how to get into the report. This is addressing Christine Williamson's question. So when you when you log in as a external user, uh, jurisdictions you have access to, or in this case, a county that you have access to, will be in this right-hand column. And then when you select a jurisdiction, in the box, in this first box, it'll say latest county capacity planning cycle available. And if it, as this one has been submitted, it says submitted, but when you go in the first time or until you submit it, it will say due next to that. Okay, and we have one more question that came into the inbox from Allison Burley, Aurora Environmental Inc. Could you please state again when uh, the access emails will be released to the counties or if they were already released? They have not been released. So we're hoping to do that within the next couple of days. That's all we have so far, Andrew. Thank you. All right, with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Jeff uh, and he's gonna talk about the organics calculator and how you can utilize those tools to help you with reporting. And then we'll have another opportunity to um, ask more questions after that. Sorry, Jeff, I lost my button. I'm almost there. Okay, thank you. Okay. There you go, Jeff. Hi, sorry, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Jeff. Um, so yeah, um, again, my name is Jeff McDaniel. I was on the team that helped develop the organic waste recycling and edible food recovery calculator tools. And we wanted to briefly walk you through each of the calculators. Can you see my screen with the calculator on it? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, again, this is this is just kind of a brief walkthrough for each calculator and specifically which lines in the calculator that counties will reference when they go through to compile and submit the reports. Uh, you will see as I move through the calculators that I have pre-filled data into the calculator fields. 
We did that because we did not intend to show you a step-by-step -step of the calculators like we did back in 2021. Um, there is a pre-recorded webinar available on our website for folks that would like a tutorial. Uh, but that said, if anyone listening would like a personal step-by-step -step guide through the calculators, I am available to coordinate that with you and um, my contact information will be made available. So in accessing the organic waste capacity calculator, there's, you know, there's several ways to get there. One is to, to simply Google Cal Recycle Capacity Patent Calculator. And then when you select the, the link here, it'll pop up to this website. Another is through the Cal Recycle website itself. Once in the tool, you can you know, read the background, a special note, each jurisdiction's responsibilities and instructions. And you're gonna go ahead and select the disposal data year as 2021 in the period covered. You can scroll down here and you'll be selecting the jurisdiction or other area. Um, it's a common misconception that this red asterisk uh, indicates that you need to fill in that, that space. Um, you do not if it's not if you know if you have the name of the jurisdiction that suffices. See, uh, you're going to enter the total population and projected population, and then click search. I like to use defaults um, in order to you know for the um, to utilize the 2018 waste characterization study. Um, you'll see those percentages for step C. For the total disposal, soon this number will be feeding information from the RDRS numbers. That's currently in testing. It's not, um, I, I pre-filled this number and, and if it's not automatically provided, you'll want to put in the most up-to-date information that you have available to you. If you have ADC or biosolid digestate disposal information, you can plug that in here. Not everyone does. See in step E, you have an option to fill in specific percentages of different organic materials as well as optional facility types. Here I've kind of pre-selected some material types and a facility type that it would go to. If you have a question about what any of these means, you can select the question mark and it'll give you a definition of the material type. Selected a few for composting as well. Again, if you hover over and click on the circle with a question mark, if you have a question about what a particular facility type is, it'll give you the definitions. You see where it breaks down the tons per facility type. Step F allows users to input specific facilities to which they make organic, uh, take organic materials. We have. For each facility type, a user may select facilities or sites that report in the RDRS or input information for facilities and sites that may not be in RDRS. And you'll see where it says in RDRS and not in RDRS. You know, if it's uh, if you're adding a record for something that's not in the RDRS as is, you're gonna have to plug in that information manually. Users can um, then enter predicted the tonnages. Sorry, before I move on, after you've entered that, you can select predicted annual tonnages for what that facility type may be able to accept and then indicate whether or not that has been verified or not verified. Um, and it's right here. It says true if it's verified. And if it's not, then you just make sure this is not checked and that will come up as false. Mm -hmm. such 
for the purposes of this example, we'll just say that it's true. And then moving down, I also entered information for a composting facility. You might see that as I scroll through. Yeah, see for composting or recycling center. Again, this is just made up. This is not real data. Um, this is just for example purposes. Let's see here. Instead of G, if we get to it, there's a lot of facility types to enter here. Try, to, try not to make everyone too dizzy as I scroll down. All right. You might have an idea. If you haven't already used these tools, these tools can be pretty, um, pretty large. And um, if you feel overwhelmed by that, then you can feel free to contact me and I'll be able to walk you through it. So in step G, uh, users can input information for facilities to indicate changes in new or expanded organics capacity. You see, I made up some information here and plugged in the predicted tonnage. It kind of cranks it out here into this field automatically. Step H is where you get to see the numbers um, that we need for the report that was shown by Andrew. Namely, the top three boxes here, uh, total projected organics disposal in three years, the total existing new or expanded capacity that has been verified, and the shortfall or excess in organics capacity. So these top three fields. From here, you can export that to Excel. Um, I think for this purposes, I don't necessarily need to do that. We can move on to the edible food recovery component. Again, going back to the, um, you know, to Google, if you were to type in Cal Recycle Edible Food Capacity Planning Calculator and then select the tool you're going to get a download for Excel. The edible food calculator is in a different format. And again, I've already kind of free um, pulled this up and pre-loaded some information here. But you will see tabs on the bottom of the page down here in yellow. The first being about the background, about the tool, schedule for reporting, and instructions for each of the other tabs. The second tab has important definitions, so you can reference. The third tab is titled Edible Food Disposed. It covers the jurisdiction's name, the reporting year, which begins in 2022 and ends in 2024, as well as the change in population data that you can plug in. Um, let's see here, edible food conversion factors, where you estimate the overall quantity of potentially donatable food disposed by each commercial edible food generator type. We have here. So you're in step 4A, calculates the edible food disposed by type. Um, that's this first column. Let me see, it's column B down in 4A. So this is where it takes each tier one and tier two edible food generator, and you can say, you know, the number, the total number of each type. It's plugged in the number that you plugged into the top and the, and the column C. You just sort of, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so folks can get an idea of how big this tool is here. And you'll see on the, the right, it breaks down. This is section uh, 4B, which is an optional step that calculates amounts of food disposed by food type. Let me zoom back in. Scrolling down. You know, I've just kind of arbitrarily thrown in some numbers of, you know, the numbers, potential, let's see here. The fourth tab 
is titled Edible Food Capacity Details. It houses step 5A for edible food capacity details for recovery, existing or new and expanded. So this is where you would plug in the information. It gives you an example at the top. Um, this is where you would put in the actual recovery organizations themselves, as well as contact information. Sorry about that. Any specific notes you want to say, like open only on the weekends or accepts anything that does not require refrigeration. Anything relevant to you, as well as the verifiable capacity accepted to the jurisdiction. All right, let me zoom out of this as well, just to give you a feel for what it looks like. Um, so again, the step 5B also allows you to break it down by food type. This is an optional step. Scrolling over and zoom out. Sorry, my computer is freezing on me here. Fix. Yeah, there we go. This bottom column here indicates the new and expanded. Again, I've sort of pre-filled some information here. New organizations, expanded capacity. Um, extra notes, you know, a potential example could be that they need refrigerators or funding for staff. Right, and then some totals down at the bottom. The, la the fifth and final tab at the bottom is the summary. Um, no data is no data entry is needed for this. Here it is calculated. Um, it has already calculated the numbers we need for the report, and the numbers that are required for the report that was presented by Andrew are going to be right here on E sixteen future target year F uh, sixteen, which is the verifiable capacity, and then um, G, which is, or sorry, maybe it's H. Yeah, potential of shortfall. E, F, and H. And that concludes my walkthrough of the edible food capacity calculator tool. Thanks, Jeff. Do you have questions about the tool tools that Jeff just presented? We do. Our first question is from Ellen Law. Um, to confirm the organic waste capacity plan and exercises to plan for diversion of organic waste that is currently being landfilled. I believe this is referring to earlier, Andrew, you spoke about generation, which would be everything currently landfilled and being diverted from their understanding. I think we're going to need a little extra context there. So I'm going to go ahead and you, you Ellen, um, if you can speak to that. Thanks. Or can you hear me? Uh -huh. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, sorry if that wasn't, or if that was kind of confusing, but um, like, I guess referring back to that calculator for the organic waste capacity planning exercise. So we, the jurisdictions in the county, we're compiling information um, to plan for all of those organics that are currently being landfilled, correct? So that doesn't account for anything that the jurisdictions are currently being diverted. So when we're talking about um, like verifiable um, capacity, that just means to account for the materials that aren't currently being diverted, right? Not the sum of those two numbers, I guess, if that makes more sense. Correct, yeah, and, and Kara, if you wanna correct me if I'm incorrect, but I, I believe that it is what is currently being disposed, not what is also being diverted, adding to, to that. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully that provided um, a significant response for you, Ellen. Yes, thank you.
Okay, our next question is from Zinchi Tan. Um, just a clarifying question. What are the red asterisks for in the report? Um, it, I mean, it's important information. Um, if you, I, I don't believe, it, but it's not. It's not that it's a required information. Chris, do you remember if that's more or less how we define that? Just yeah, a red um, asterisk means you have to put something in that field to move along. Now there is a, a slight twist on that. If you notice in step A, you have an option of picking a jurisdiction or an other area. Um, that was a kind of a, a fallback setting to account for the special collection or the special districts that provide solid waste collection services because initially they were not included in the drop down info of the report. And uh, they are now, now they've been added to the logic system. So those are still there. Um, so that if that one required field isn't actually required. It's only required if you weren't picking something from the drop down before. The next question is from Clifton Chu. Previously, we used to find data on facilities for potential capacity on the FACET webpage. Is there another way to find similar data? Um, yeah, you could conduct a local waste characterization study. Um, if, uh, if anyone else has another suggestion there. I don't think that's quite the question, uh, oh. Jeff. This actually, Facet might have been a little bit before your time, even though it was new and awesome when it rolled out. Facet is referring to an old facility information tool that Cal Recycle had available for a few years. It provided information, specific information on facilities that wasn't necessarily related to their solid waste information system and permitting data that is found in the Swiss database. Um, Facet was since retired a few years ago, along as the implementation of the RDRS regulations and data gathering came online. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a great replacement for Facet in that sense of having the and or the facility generated. If they chose to, they could put in their available capacity into that system as part of their uh, submittals. Um, unfortunately. That wasn't a requirement and it's still not. So the only way to get accurate remaining capacity of, at a facility is to contact them. Um, if you look at, if you were to look at the Swiss uh, website, Solid Waste Information Systems, that might give you their max permitted. That doesn't mean that's their max daily intake that they're currently doing, nor does it mean that that space hasn't already been claimed by someone else. So the only way to get verifiable information really is to have an existing contract or be working on one, or to at least call them directly and inquire, hey, we've got 10,000 tons a year we could bring. Would you be able to you know, take our material as well? Thank you, hopefully that cleared everything up. The next question is from Dave Ghirardelli. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, they ask, the first part of the calculator is very useful and we thank CalRecycle staff for putting together the tool, but for the facility type section, it's often a series of, a series of round pegs and square holes um, to describe marketplace dynamics. Are jurisdictions required to use the calculator format? Uh, no, the the calculator itself is is an optional tool in general. Um, um, yeah, it certainly was not really possible for us to build in every scenario into it. Um, I don't know if, if Chris wants to add any more to that. Uh, yeah, I can I can add to that. the The tool was meant to maybe be a little bit more involved than what is the requirement. Uh, for the reporting, we tried to make as great a planning tool as we could. So not every detail that's in there is necessarily what is required to be submitted either to the county or to us. And you know, if you get an implementation schedule, we might need more detail. But the tool was meant to to do as much as it could and to give people a way to estimate some of this stuff. And I'll reemphasize that this is a a planning exercise, and it's a tool. And you know, if you're trying to get this down to the uh, you know nearest tenth of a ton. That is amazing, but also it's, you know, you're planning something a few years out, 
it's going to be impossible to be 100% accurate. So it's really to give you an idea on ballpark on you know how much of each specific kind of organic uh, waste you have that could be in your disposal stream. You know we're using the defaults from the 2018 waste characterization. If you have your own local waste characterization, you're definitely able to put that in and not use the defaults. So is it required to use it? No. Is it recommended? Sure. And we do know a few counties that basically ask their jurisdictions to please use the tool, use the export. That way as the county's compiling this stuff, they're looking at a consistent format to try to figure out what, what they're seeing rather than we've got 10 cities and mailed it 10 different ways. And you know the county might find that a little bit more difficult to figure out what exactly they need to put in or where jurisdictions at in their planning. Also, Jeff, could you pass a uh, presentation back to Andrew, please? Certainly. Thank you. While you go ahead and get that taken care of, our next question is from Jack Steinman. If a jurisdiction has non-verified recycling capacity available to them, should a county report this as capacity available to the jurisdiction in our organic in our organics recycling capacity study report? For example, the city of Brisbane's hauler organic waste to Napa recycling to be composted, but does not hold an agreement outlining how much capacity is guaranteed to the hauler. And that's that I, I guess it. Jeff, I can start with that a little bit, but I'd like Kara to jump in at some point if I say something wrong. Uh, at the end of the calculator, there are a few different numbers. You know, it shows you your total waste generated, which is a number you would need to tell the county so they can add it up and report it. And it tells your verifiable capacity, and it gives you a shortfall of capacity that's available but not verifiable. And and perhaps that's a little bit of a gray area. Like if you've already been sending stuff there, great. But what happens if someone else comes at comes out and contracts that space, and now you may be stuck not being able to use it. And Jeff, did you did you go over the uh, hey this number is where this would go for this uh, piece of the reporting, and this number goes here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we in in this specific example, it's probably best to also discuss this with your local assistance rep and figure out the best way to handle it. Because yes, verifiable does mean a contract or some type of written agreement, something where you have the space now, but can it be taken away from you? And Carol, would you like to add anything else on that? Yeah. Hey. Thanks, Chris. It's a great question. Based upon the example that you provided, it sounds to me like the city does not know if it has access to that capacity. Um, so in that case, and so I'm making some assumptions here, and, and maybe um, we can unmute so we can have a conversation um, if the team can do that. But in the event that you you do not know where the capacity is coming from, so if you don't know that that facility is going to take your material and you don't have a plan um, for that material, that is that last box on the calculator tool. That's that total where you have you have a need for capacity, but you have no idea where you're going to get it from. Another example, um, if the city is currently negotiating between the hauler and the processor, right? Um, and, and you're going to be coming up with a contract and the facility is going to be taking your material, then that um, can go in that box where you've got planned capacity. So you don't have it yet, but you're working on the contract that's going to, that's where your material is going to go. In that case, you have a plan. Um, for new or expanded capacity. So that would go up in that total above and wouldn't trigger an implementation schedule. So there's a few nuances that I'm, I don't have from the question that was asked that I would need that detail to tell you exactly which box it goes to. So if you'd like to... Jack is unmuted. Oh, great. Hey, Jack. So, open for conversation. Okay, uh, no, thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. Um, I think in in this case, I I think the answer you gave me is is good for now. I may need to follow up with um, 
once once I have a, a a bit more of the specifics, but I I do think it's um, it would have fallen into the first situation, not the not the second where a contract uh, is currently being set up. Yeah, sounds like it. That was my inclination as well. But Jack, if you want to set up a call um, with the city and you and our team, um, so we can talk through get those details. Uh, feel free to to reach out to the LAM liaison. We'll get something set up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, you bet. Okay. We still have time for more questions. Yes. Okay. Next is David Goldstein's question. Some of the grids start with quote amount disposed. Does does that mean the amount currently sent to landfill, or does it mean generated? You know, it, I'm not sure. it means the amount of material that is disposed during that reporting period. Um, we're not talking about generation, which is quantifying all the diversion that's happening and how much is being disposed. So the regulations um, are really focused on what is estimated to be being disposed during that reporting cycle? How, how are you planning for the capacity that you will need for that additional disposal? And I think it was Andrew, Chris said, uh, maybe it was Chris, that this really is a planning exercise. We we do not expect you, it was Chris, to, to get it down to the 10th decimal point. I mean, this truly is a planning exercise and it really is intended to ensure that jurisdictions are uh, communicating with specific entities like facilities, haulers, with edible food, um, those food recovery organizations, and, and really having a robust approach to planning for capacity instead of just assuming that capacity will be available. So um, David, let us know if that helped answer your question, but your focus is on what's estimated to be disposed during the reporting um, cycle, in this case, this first report covers uh, to a two-year period. I will go ahead and unmute Dave um, on our end if they would like to add anything to that. But the second part um, was also regarding painted treated wood. It's highly unmarketable and should be disposed. Are they required to account for the organics recycling capacity for this type of material? So in section 189921F, it lists the organic materials that you do the capacity planning for. And that is not one of them. Dave, if you have anything to add, go ahead and unmute yourself and take that opportunity. Yeah, I just, I, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate us uh, kind of keeping the you know, our, our eye on the ball in terms of uh, public health and environmental protection, which is the business we're in. Um, the calculator puts painted treated wood in there as an organic material being disposed. So that adds significantly to our total organics disposed figure. So when we do our report, we kind of need to start off saying, well, we're taking painted treated wood out of the picture um, before we start doing our calculations. So the calculator uh, tool includes it. Uh, and I, I appreciate having a comprehensive picture of, of everything that is an organic material uh, in carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms it, it going into landfill that we're trying to divert, but that's part of the the total disposal, the 51.08% painted treated wood is significant. So when we do our reporting, our, our planning submittal, we kind of need to take that off the, the, the top before we begin our discussion about our organics infrastructure. So I appreciate that um, uh, you recognize that material kind of comes off 
before we start talking about uh, how we meet our 50% uh, reduction in currently disposed. And, and uh, again, thank you for clarifying that to the last question. That's all, thanks. Perfect. We have a question that came into the SLCP inbox from Kevin Barnes with Provost Pritchard Consulting Group. Is there any cow recycle information that an organic processing facility can look up to to know which local jurisdictions are counting on capacity at their facility? I guess I will take that and say, no, if you know of a way, if anyone knows of a way, that'd be great, but that's not something that would necessarily be publicly available, either through cow recycle or I don't know of any other source for that. It's it's really a proprietary information in some ways on their part, so they may not want to publicize, you know, public in a large scale. Hey, look, we've got all this space. So that really comes back to one-on-one -on -one communication with facilities you may be utilizing or that your hauler may be utilizing. Thank you for that, Chris. Next question is from Sharon Mitchell asking, how should jurisdictions estimate the amount of organic waste disposed and verifiable organic waste capacity in their service areas receiving an elevation waiver? Do we only estimate the amount of green waste and the amount of capacity for green waste and not include food waste since that would be landfill? Yes, if you have a waiver, you are only doing your capacity planning on the materials that are not included in that waiver. And that's actually a really good question in terms of the calculator because the calculator uh, has pre-input or if you use the default, it would have pre-input pre -input percentages for all the materials. And while you do need to, you will need to know the amount of that material and you can use the calculator to estimate that uh, for the, your total organics and for uh, information you need to put in the annual report. It, what you would want to do is you know, do the full calculation and then back out that those numbers and change them to zero percent because that way it's not kind of included in your overall capacity planning um, and also do something to to reiterate that the tool does a lot more than what is required for the reporting and we're looking for your total organics base you know compared to your available capacity and as kara mentioned also that, that you know you're not going to get it down to the tenth of a ton we're just making sure that you have enough to cover it. And certain materials, definitely, they can be problematic or maybe a little harder to place. But you're, you know, planning exercise, you're just trying to get a handle on what, what you have and what you need. And so for in terms of an elevation waiver, figure out that percentage. If it's 10% of your 10,000 tons, boom, you know you have 1,000 tons of food waste. But then you would change that number to zero in the calculator to back that out of your total. I think we're running out of time for this session, but we'll go ahead and get one from Kelly Schoonmaker. Um, regarding biosolids, Jeff mentioned that you would enter the information in the calculator, but that many jurisdictions will not have the information. How will this information be ascertained if not entered by the jurisdiction? Is it not required? Oh no, allow me to clarify. I just meant that not all jurisdictions have those types of facilities um, that they would be pulling the number, those numbers from. Does that clarify? And something else to, to mention on the calculator next to that field, there is a tool tip that has a link to the California Association of Sanitation Agencies website. And the that's basically the, the wastewater treatment group. They may be able to provide that information if you don't directly have it, but it is organic material that may be getting disposed and you are required to plan on your capacity for it. If it's already being diverted, then you don't need to worry about it. And I think that's something else to mention in terms of the calculator. We're only looking at what's currently being disposed. If it's already being diverted or recycled in some way, that's not part of, of this at all. Kelly, you're unmuted on our end. If there was anything else you wanted to add to that. Oh, yeah, I do. Thanks. Um, thank you for that. Um, we do have that information, but it's broken down by wastewater treatment plant. So I guess I had a, a follow-up question. Is 
the biosolids requirement only for like a city that operates its own wastewater treatment plant? Hey Kelly, it's Kara. Hey, yeah. um yeah, it's it's yeah, it's related to the jurisdiction that um that facility is located within. So whether or not I mean some are are privately operated, there's very few, most are public um facilities, but it's related to if the facility is located, the wastewater treatment plant is located in a jurisdiction, they are the ones responsible for planning for that material that comes out of that facility, not all of the jurisdictions that, you know, whose wastewater goes into that facility. Does that help? Yeah, so I just want to make sure I understand. So, for example, a wastewater treatment plant like East Bay Mud that serves many jurisdictions the city of Oakland is on the hook for all of those biosolids, even though they don't have control over what East Bay Mud does with the biosolids. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, that Yeah, that is correct. And I <laughs> <Okay>. think <laughs> that's it. Okay. Right, but we would be looking at, um, you know, I think the key would be collaboration with East Bay Mud as far as, you know, because you were talking about kind of that authority situation, like they don't have authority to direct what happens to it. So, you know, we haven't had any issues yet where a jurisdiction has a situation where the wastewater treatment plant is, I don't know, recalcitrant or, you know, not doing what it needs to do. But certainly we could um, intervene and play a role um, uh, but it, it's really that collaboration between, say, Oakland and East Bay Mud to pull together the data, what are the plans, um, and yeah, so does that help? Um, yeah, I, I, one clarifying question, does CalRecycle have any enforcement um, ability over wastewater treatment plants in the state? Well, um, that's a, a great question. I don't know if Ashley is on, Andrew. Hi, Mayor. Yeah. Ashley, do you uh, want to talk? Yeah. So, sorry, this isn't a great answer, but it depends. So, it depends on how they're permitted and if they're even permitted by us. Um, so, there are some, or I think a majority of the wastewater treatment plants that are not permitted by us because it doesn't have anything to do with technically our definition of solid waste in the permitting world. Um, it's very interesting case now that some uh, POTWs are starting to bring in other waste streams potentially, depending on if they have an AD on site. And so our permitting team is looking into these circumstances and if they need to have a permit through us now, and they're working out those scenarios now. So it kind of depends on how they're permitted in terms of our enforcement authority over them. Does that help? Yes, and sorry, uh -huh. one more question. So, but it wouldn't matter if they are permitted by you or not, the jurisdiction in which they're located still is responsible for planning for composting capacity over the wastewater treatment plant, whether it's public or privately owned. Correct. So, um, whether or not they're permitted by Cal Recycle or not, you could for sure include them in your capacity planning. Okay. Okay. Hey, Kelly, one, one more point. Kelly, one more point to add to that too is, you know, some of these larger facilities like East Bay Mud, um, you know, while Oakland is ultimately responsible, I think that's an example where, you know, whether it's Stop Waste or the county and, and the city and East Bay Mud and, and all of the jurisdictions that are sending material to, I think there is a collaboration. Um, and that's really what the capacity planning is about, is about collaborating as a region, as a, a county group, to figure out capacity and what's needed. So um, I just wanted to add that in. Okay, thank you. And, and I just wanted to add that in terms of how this would be calculated using the calculator, if, if the material was being disposed by East Bay Mud, there, it would be applied to City of Oakland's disposal total uh, if it was being used as ADC, it would be, you know, added as ADC. And there are fields in the calculator to, you know, add that information in. But it, it's it can get a little complicated with that. But yeah, it would be it would be coming back to the city, and so you might need to adjust how the 
how you add tons in the calculator to account for it. But also the, those materials are not included in the waste characterization because it's not something that would come in normal truckloads per day and wasn't characterized when Cal Recycle did that a few years ago. Mm, okay. Um, so uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, I do understand it. It does have to be disposed. My understanding, I'm sorry to keep harping on this, but or like keep you guys talking about biosolids, but uh, if it's used it, it, as ADC, it no longer counts as diversion, correct? Is that, is that not disposal or maybe I misunderstood that? Yeah, for, for 13 free uh, capacity planning, correct. It would go in the disposal column. That's what I thought. Okay, thanks for confirming that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is a separate line item in the calculator to account for that because the disposal that you'd be seeing that's going to be in the calculator, I guess is a good time to mention we are updating the calculator hopefully in the next day or two along with the report release that for jurisdictions that have data for RDRS, it will load that. But that ADC data isn't necessarily considered disposal in terms of how 939 would operate. So that number will be something that could be added in on a oh, separate item by the jurisdiction. I see. Okay. Thank you very much, you guys. Yes. Thank you all for that. Um, we also have a question from David Briggs regarding biosolids. Um, if that didn't clear things up for you, David. Um, you are unmuted on our end. Um, it was uh, it was interesting <laughs> and did kind of uh, answer my question. Um, what I'm most interested in is um, like in Napa County, our situation is we have one good size um, POTW and they've been land applying their treated biosolids for years. So that's that seems pretty straightforward. There's several other small ones <clears throat> in the county for the smaller cities, all operated by the cities. Um, and their, you know, pond settlings, their their treatment biosolid has been going to landfill. So do we need to, I mean, that's the only thing I think Napa County would have to show for missing capacity for diverting organics from landfill would we have to notify those small cities that they need an implementation plan for within the first three-year planning period just for that to show that they yeah, Dave, that's a great question and i don't necessarily know that you need well your situation may be a little unique technically those cities who have that um, plant um should already know that that's in their disposal column, right? And they should already know that they should be working on a plan to deal with how they're gonna, you know, come up with um, an approach to managing that material. If 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 they um, again um, don't yet have a plan for either new or expanded capacity for that material, then in their calculation that they're doing themselves. Um, they would be, you know, noting that we don't have a plan yet, and therefore that's what triggers an implementation schedule. And technically, they should be telling you that, you know, we've got this amount of material for this material type that we don't have a plan for, and so we are going to need an implementation schedule. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise with you having to tell them, although maybe you've got some jurisdictions where you'll be like, hey, by the way, um, you know, you didn't you know, make note of this when you sent me your data, but I know for sure that you don't, you know, you haven't addressed it. So it's probably gonna depend on what they give to you and how um, informed <laughs> each of those cities are. You may be telling them, but um, technically they really should be telling you and understanding that they have a gap in capacity. It, yeah, underst I mean, they were pretty straightforward once you know, I convinced them they they did need to provide the information. They, they they did provide us with tonnage information for dewatered biosolids, and they don't have a good answer for what they could do with it. So, um, like I said, they've they've been landfilling it, and, and this is several small POTWs. So, uh, it sounds like we do need to, and it is part of the countywide process, right? The planning is the last step in that is notifying those jurisdictions that that don't have uh, verified capacity yeah. for 
or processing. Yeah. Uh, and this whole question of processing with biosolids is a funny one. Yeah. It mean, is. Are, a they, yeah, are they processed by virtue of treating them through a dewatering yeah. treatment process? Or are they processed in that we've identified where they're going to go after being dewatered? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's that latter part. You know, how is that material not going to go to landfill? What's the option? I guess, Dave, the only thing I would add, and this applies to any county, what we're really hopeful for it, before the report is submitted is if the jurisdictions know that there's a capacity issue, we're really hopeful that the county can help facilitate conversations now, right, to try and come up with um, some planned um options um and so this would be a great one to pull together those jurisdictions those facilities maybe the largest wastewater treatment plant and really start some brainstorming on could there be any options because if there are and if you all can come up with some options prior to august one then you can put that number in the planned new or expanded capacity column and not necessarily trigger meeting an implementation schedule. The implementation schedule is really intended for jurisdictions that during the planning period, right, which is really now until August 1, um, didn't come up with a viable solution. And that, that solution doesn't have to mean that on August 2nd, that material is being um, recovered. What it means is they could have a plan and maybe that material is going to start being recovered, I don't know, six months from August 1, right? So planned, um, you know, planned capacity, new capacity doesn't necessarily have to happen on August 2nd. So I really encourage you and happy to do a follow up um, if we can help with the conversation. But I think some, some getting that group together with a larger facility and, and trying to come up some, with um, some real viable options prior to August 1, that could um, avoid having those cities having to do an implementation schedule. But ultimately, it's not your responsibility. So, you know, um, I do want to give you that out. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have that in writing? Okay. Yeah, um, it seems like there's work to do there, um, and I think it is dawning on the smaller jurisdictions that that's the case. So, um, okay, what I'm hearing is if there is maybe working with the hauler, even uh, hauler and processing facility operator, we might come up with some answers there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, finding a site for land application between now and August. Um, We've had two years for this and I haven't gotten anywhere with that idea. So yeah. uh, that's, I know. that's gonna be I, a tough one. So. It could be a tough one. And, and, and it's entirely possible those cities will have to submit an implementation schedule to us as to how they're gonna plan for that capacity. Um, but you know, I would love to see them exploring and trying to come up with an option for either new or expanded capacity. In this case, it might be um, options for land application. Okay, um, that gives me something to work with, so I appreciate it. Thank you, Carol. We'll go into David Goldstein's question. If the calculator subtracts capacity from disposal, how do we account for the fact that organic disposal will be items like textiles and carpets, and some capacity will be for items like yard clippings? You are not required to do capacity planning for textiles and carpets. That's also why they are not line items in the waste characterization section of the calculator. Perfect. Um, Allison Burley asked, in step E of the organic capacity calculator, should there be a primary facility activity type for each line item? If someone on the team is responding, you might be mute. I'm not hearing any responses from the team on this question. Sorry, I was, I was reading a different inbox. There's other questions. Um, 
step E, should there be a primary facility activity type for each line item? No, there does not have to be. Um, you can choose to put that in or not. Uh, adding the primary uh, facility activity type is really just a way to for the tool to calculate certain things. So let's say you have five different materials that are going to composting. Uh, that helps add up that number and it will display lower in the calculator. So that way you might not have to scroll up and down as much. So that's a totally optional field. You can choose to use it or not. Perfect. Eric Rodriguez asks or mentions, we have received submittals indicating that the jurisdiction confirms that they will require 100% organic subversion through their hauler contracts. Will that qualify as planned expanded capacity for this exercise? Hey, Ray, can you repeat that one more time for me? Thanks. Sure. Um, so they indicate that they have received submittals indicating that the jurisdiction confirms that they will require 100% organics diversion through their hauler contracts. Um, so will that qualify as planned expanded capacity for this exercise? So I'm gonna use the Ashley answer and it might, <laughs> and it depends. Um, you know, if, if the hauler has no idea yet where they're gonna get that capacity from, that, that really isn't considered verifiable. Um, however, many haulers may already have a contract for capacity. They may be expanding or building their own facility or whatever. So there's a little bit more detail that's missing from that for me to, to give you an answer either way. Um, again, um, uh, the jurisdiction may be requiring their hauler to have capacity, but it would be important that the jurisdiction knows that that hauler does actually have the capacity now, or there is new capacity or expanded capacity coming. So um, maybe we can go um, to the person asking the question and see if that helped answer the question. Thanks. Sure, Eric, you are unmuted on our end. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and provide some more clarification. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the, the clarification. And yeah, that does kind of cover the, the multitude of responses that we've gotten here in LA County, right? You can't even go over how many different types of answers we've received so far. But yes, I, I think that does uh, uh, clarify quite a bit, right? That just there needs to be there needs to be some kind of confirmation with the jurisdictions yeah. that they know where it's going to go in the end, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, fair enough. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, you bet, thank you. Yeah, and you know, bottom line, again, this is a planning exercise, right? So in the example you gave, um, if a jurisdiction and its hauler um, didn't really have capacity, we're gonna catch that on our end when we do an evaluation of a jurisdiction and find out, oh, they're not collecting organics from all the generators because they have no place to take it. So that's how much of this information, how it all ties together with implementation and our reviews of jurisdiction. So great question. Thanks. Appreciate it. Perfect. Next up, we have Trishana Robinson. Do counties need to indicate in the report or some other way which jurisdictions have informed us that they have an NOIC, SB 619, waiver or extension? I could take that. This is Ashley. Um, so yes, you will need to notify some way that the jurisdictions did not provide you the data because they have uh, the SB 619 NOIC approval. Um, so what you'll do is if your city tells you that they do not have capacity planning info because they submitted a NOIC and it's been approved, you would let us know in your August 1st report. After that, we, CalRecycle, will work with those individual cities via the 619 corrective action plans to ensure that the information is submitted to the county and us in a timely manner for when they will have uh, their capacity planning info. Does that help? Shoshana, you're unmuted on our end if you'd like to speak to that.
Okay, I'll go ahead and take that as a question asked and answered. Um, next question is from Jack Steinman. To clarify in the organics recycling capacity planning study report, the quote, organic waste recycling capacity verifiably available field should only include the amount of recycling capacity that is unused currently, not the total available, correct? The total available to the jurisdiction. Hey, can we um, have Jack add clarity? Because um, the terms used are a little confusing to me. Sure, Jack, you are unmuted. You can go ahead and speak. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for the uh, unclear question. So I'm I'm thinking in this in this column of the reports, if I if I get a report from a city saying they have say 10,000 tons of recycling capacity. But today, 9,000 tons of that capacity is being used. And in the future, that's that's what they expect the, um, the capacity will stay. There's, there's really only 1,000 tons of surplus capacity. So in this, in this yeah. field, would I be reporting that there's 10,000 tons of capacity available or there's only that one thousand that's that's currently not used. Um, thanks for that. That really helps, Chuck. So, again, um, I'll, I'll give the Ashley. It depends. So, one thing I heard you say is that some of that nine thousand could be future capacity. So, if it's if it's future capacity, maybe they're expanding or it's new capacity. I guess it would only be expanding then that, some of that capacity could actually be added to the 1,000, right? If that all that 9,000 is currently being utilized, then it would just be the 1,000. So I felt like there was a nuance there that I wanted to add um, to your scenario. Does that make sense, yeah. Jack? Yes. Yes, I, yes, I think it does. Um, yeah. Yeah, so again, and this goes back to, to responding to Dave, capacity can be existing available capacity, which in your scenario would be maybe just that 1,000. It can also be any new or expanded capacity, that capacity that hasn't come online yet, but it's going to, right? Maybe a, a facility is going through an expansion so it can take in more material, it's buying equipment so it can process more material, or there's an entirely new facility. So that, that capacity doesn't have to be online on say right now or August 2nd, maybe it's capacity that's coming online in 2023, for example. That can go in that line and the calculator tool of existing new or expanded capacity that you, you have um, uh, verified access to. Versus the last line is you have no idea where you're gonna get your additional capacity from. Does that help, Jack? It does. It does. Thanks, Kara. You bet. Thank you. Next up is Sadie Caldas. It's a bit of a long question. The recycling calculator calculates the amount of organic waste based on population. So we have done our capacity planning based on the amount of organic waste that would be disposed if we did not have an outlet for it, not the amount of organic waste that is currently being disposed. If we report the number that would be disposed with no outlet, although we are already recycling, and then show enough capacity for our organic waste, organic waste, will that still satisfy the requirements? And Sadie, you are unmuted on our end if you'd like to join that conversation. Uh, yes, hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I guess that, it's the first box that I'm really asking about on the um, the reporting. It says estimated organic waste for landfill disposal, and I my understanding was that we take take that based on um, what we use in the calculator if we choose to use the calculator, and based on the amount of capacity that we need. And uh, from some of the questions that were answered earlier it sounds like we're supposed to be calculating what is actually being disposed and not recovered right now um, from the waste stream, which doesn't seem like it's part of the calculator. So I was hoping to get clarification on that first box. 
Yeah, so you 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 nailed it. Um, it. You're looking at what is what is being disposed during that planning period. And again, it's all estimation, right? I mean, you're putting in population. Population may be that number uh, when it comes to you know end of 2023, or it may not. So that's why really these are there are estimates of how much is estimated to be disposed during, in this case, 2022 to 20 end of 2024. Um, and then based upon that, what capacity can, are you, do you have or need to, or will be um, expanded or new capacity to be able to deal with that increase in disposal? It's, in, it's entirely possible. Um, some, some jurisdictions um, may not have much growth, for example, and they may have all the capacity that they need. So, you know, for them, they they there's no implementation schedule necessary because they've got they've either got existing capacity enough for that, even if there's growth over the next two years, or they have new capacity coming along or expanded. So it's about what is being disposed. Did that help? Hi, Kara. Yeah, thank you. That does help. Um, I I guess just to further clarify, it would be what would be disposed if we didn't have an outlet for it, right? Because, I mean, we're planning on having capacity to have an outlet. So this yeah. is like with, yeah. without it being recovered. Yeah, so so it's really, think about it, break out those steps, because the way you just described it, you're combining the steps. So the first step is how much is estimated to be disposed during that reporting time, right? And then how much capacity do you know you have, which is your second point you were making, of existing capacity or new or expanded capacity. Um, then if there's a delta, right, if you've got more disposal than you have either existing new or expanded capacity for, then you've got that delta. And then, you know, it's an implementation schedule is only triggered if you have no idea, right, where you're going to get that additional capacity. What I heard you say is your calculation will likely show here's our amount disposed we've got all this capacity and so you will probably and your it'll come up as zero for you right because you have plenty of capacity to deal with what's going to be disposed or what could be disposed or that disposal word i can see is a weird one because you're okay. not going to dispose it you're going to collect it and <laughs> divert it so i can see how that's confusing okay yes thank you kara that's um, very helpful i i get it now thank you Perfect. Um, our next set of questions come from Allison Burley. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, they have several questions regarding step E of the organics capacity calculator and the expectation for each facility capacity. I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute Allison because I think there are a few more pieces there that need to be talked about. Can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you, Alice. Great. So this question, and then I'll get to the second question, which is just about biosolids. This question is about, is is the expectation that for every line item of uh, waste characterized material um, in step E, is the expectation that there be capacity for each and uh, I should say um, recycling or composting capacity or edible food donation capacity for each and every line item. Hey, Allison, this is Kara. Um, yeah, I mean, technically, yes. Um, as Chris noted, we built the calculator with a lot of detail, so you can get really nitty gritty, but the expectation is for all of the organic waste, except that which is excluded, like textiles, carpet, et cetera, um, the expectation is that jurisdictions have a place for that material to go. So um, in Dave's earlier example, for example, he has some cities that um, may not have um, figured out what they're gonna do with their biosolids. We have some jurisdictions that have not figured out what they're gonna do for food soil paper. So in those cases, those are jurisdictions that if they have no idea um, what 
where they're going to take those materials. They have no existing planned or, or expanded capacity identified. They will um, have to submit an implementation schedule, which is basically a plan as to how they're going to deal with that, um, that material or those materials. So the biosolids don't show up in that in, well, they do show up in, in step C, but they don't show up in step E, as somebody mentioned earlier, um, that that wasn't part of the characterization. But um, so for example, somebody did mention earlier or asked a question about um, treated wood waste in that, you know, what would you do with that? Can you still hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Chris, okay, so and then I, another another example is um, the remainder composite organic non compostable. Yeah. It, so. Yeah. So there are certain material types. I'll let Chris restate his earlier response that are not in the calculator, right? I think you talked about textiles. So Chris, do you want to jump in? Yeah, so textiles and carpet are not required to have the capacity planning done, and so they weren't included in the calculator. So they're, they're not in that waste characterization step. And for biosolids, if you do put an entry in step C, where it says total biosolids and or digestic disposal in TPY, meaning tons per year, at the very bottom of step F, there is, if you're going to this level of detail in the calculator, you know, start just getting your estimates, at the very bottom of step F, under the total available biosolids and or digestate non-landfill capacity details, if you wanted to do that additional planning to like list your individual facilities, whether they're RDRS facilities or non-RDRS facilities, like you're gonna do land application, it will carry that number down all the way to almost the bottom of step F for you. Okay, so you're 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 jumping ahead kind of to my second question. Um, uh, so I'll I'll jump ahead too, and then we can maybe go back to my original question. But for the biosolids, um, that you you just said if you want to do that planning as it, it's optional and and is that because of um that i was asking about section 18987.1 um indicating that uh, a potw generating biosolids is not subject to the generator requirements and a few other things so what i meant by if is that not everyone's necessarily going to have to account for that so if a jurisdiction does need to account for it, there are places they can put that in and it will be added into the final calculations. Okay, so so then my my question is and is about um, then what does that section 18987.1 mean? Because we were under the understanding that it's not subject. I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll have Ashley also jump in. Um, so that section of the regs specifically to POTWs um, was developed through the regulatory process in that the, the um, wastewater treatment plant folks didn't want to be considered a commercial business um, because they're, they're dealing with their biosolids, have a process, et cetera. So that's why there's that specific section. So in uh, the Article 3 section where there's the commercial business requirements in Section 18984.9 and, um, and point ten, um, that's really the nexus there. So they don't have to, in their operation, um, they don't have all those specific requirements that a commercial business has, and that's really the difference. The um, they, Biosolids, is a material um, that does have to be recovered. It's not excluded. It's included in the definition of organic waste. It is uh, mentioned it throughout, including um, here and capacity planning, that it's a material type that does need to be planned for 
and does need to be addressed. Ashley, do you wanna add in? I think you covered at least what that section means. Um, Allison, does that help? Um, no, um, and just based on a previous uh, discussion back in a year ago, um, that was the understanding at the time. So um, anyway, going back to my first question, um, which is about um, the remainder composite organic non-compostable and treated wood waste. So things like that that don't make sense in the waste characterization, you know, when it spits out tonnage, we just ignore that because that's not something you would recycle or compost. True. Allison, can you can you restate? Were you talking about textiles, carpet, hazardous wood waste? No. Okay, I, I'm not talking about textiles and carpet. It's not even in this list. Right. Okay. The list. The step E. Um, one of the categories is um, treated, painted, stained wood waste. Mm -hmm. Another one is remainder slash composite or organic non-compostable. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was asking the question is, is the expectation that there is recycling or composting capacity for every single uh, line item in this? Sure. this. Yeah. You know, I think for from our part, um, we built this capacity planning tool with a lot of a lot of extra details um, so that jurisdictions that uh, wanted to utilize those features could. So it's we really leave it up to the jurisdictions to determine how detailed they're gonna go with their planning. Um, so it's really up to you. Uh, we don't, we are not reviewing your, um, your calculations. Um, they're not submitted to us. They get rolled up into the county um, those kind of uh, five or so uh, totals, um, three or four, whatever it is. Um, so it's really up to you. So there's not an expectation that you get into that level of detail. Okay. Thank you all for that. Um, next question from Greg Reyes is along the same lines asking about uh, paper good capacity. Is that included in this? Yes, that is one of the materials identified uh, that you have to report on organic waste recycling capacity in section 189921F. Next, Dave Iridelli. The statewide goal of SB 1383 is 50% and then 75% diversion of organics. If jurisdictions can't account for 100% of disposed organics, will they be required to provide an implementation plan? Only the jurisdictions that are identified by the county as needing to submit an implementation plan will be required to submit an implementation plan. Hey, Andrew, um, one thing I was hoping you could reemphasize are um, for jurisdictions that have waivers, uh, they don't have to do the capacity planning. And I want to kind of hit on if, for example, if a jurisdiction has a waiver and they um, have a wastewater treatment plant, et cetera, again, they would not be doing the capacity planning. Can you hit on that again? Sure. Um... Let me find the actual section here. So in 189921G, it talks about the county requirements for the estimates that need to be made. And a county is not required to obtain information from a jurisdiction that is away from all the organic waste collection requirements of this chapter. So if they have an elevation waiver, they do not have to account for food waste and food soiled paper. And if you have a low population waiver, you would and it only applied to certain census tracts, you would not need to account 
for those census tracts waived, but you would need to account for the ones not waived. Is that what you want me to cover? Do you want me to go into more detail, Kara? Well, I think that's perfect. I just, uh, you know, especially because we have some uh, uh, folks who represent areas that have low pop waivers, and then we just spent a lot of time talking about biosolids. Just wanted to make sure that that we re-emphasized that point that you may have a jurisdiction or part of a jurisdiction, and if that area is waived, um, you would not even include the biosolids, for example. So. And um, you know all of that capacity planning that needs to be done wouldn't wouldn't be happening. So just want to make sure we called that out. Yeah, Thanks, thank you, Kara. Do you have any other questions? I know we had a request to go back to the settable food grid, but I want to make sure the questions are answered first. We do have one more question from the SLCP inbox. It's uh, actually Ray. I already answered it in the email, just so we didn't have perfect. to broadcast names and numbers and addresses perfect yeah it was a little specific so as long as that's taken care of um we can go ahead and go back to the edible food recovery grid okay so i created a new report for uh, del norte just so you could see it and as you can see it's blank this one's not edited or filled out give it a second why this loads and then i'll open up that form screen of the edible food recovery capacity grid. Okay. All right, and so I, I don't remember um, if they're still on the line or not, but was there something specific that you wanted to see here f further explained? Andrew, do you recall who that question was from? I do not, but I'll scroll up and see if I can find him. Sorry about that. And if there's any other questions in the meantime, we can jump to those while I find this person. Uh, Sadie just popped in the chat at the bottom saying it was Sadie. Yeah. And Sadie oh, okay. said that it was from them and it perfect answer. Okay, perfect. And that's all we have. Okay. Well we'll hang out here for a little bit longer. We are getting kind of close to our time, but just double check if there's any um, if you're watching on the broadcast, you can email slcp.organics at calorycycle.ca.gov. And we can put your questions in the chat and answer them live here. And I guess I'll just put contact information up while we're waiting as well. So if things come to mind after this webinar, you can get a hold of us here. Uh, I'll reemphasize a few points. So the county capacity planning report is not um, available yet. We're just working out a few uh, bugs on our end and we should hopefully be releasing that in the next couple of days. And we'll send out a, um, a listserv message when it is available. Um, there's another point I wanted to make. Actually, Andrew, I think we just got an update from IT. So it may be tomorrow, which will be awesome. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention once again is that if you're a county contact and you're not one of the designated SLCP contacts as identified in the April 1 report, please have one of those two folks or one folk if they were both contacts uh, submit an email to logic, L-O-G-I-C, at calrecycle.ca.gov to get you added as a either a report editor or if they just want to allow certain people to see what's going in there uh, we can offer that access as well so once again just submit a request to logic at calrecycle.ca.gov we did get another question in the chat pane from christine williamson since low population waivers do not waive tier one or tier two generators from their obligations do we still need to include waived areas in our edible food recovery capacity planning? 
Yes. I can just confirm. Yeah, a Andrew, that's correct. There are no waivers for the edible food recovery capacity. Thank you, Daniel. And then this, we are recording this webinar as well. So as soon as we make it ADA compliant, we will post it on our website and we'll send out a list or message of exactly where that lives if you wanna refer back to this. So I think now that we are winding up, yeah, we will keep the line open for another 10 minutes while we still have some people. I'd like to thank the team that worked on this, specifically Andrew and, and our great programmers and our IT uh, division with Luna and especially Isaac and Elvis and all the work that went in to get this done. And also Jeffrey for reviewing the incredibly complicated calculators that you know, if, if used, used right, man, they can do a lot for you. But yeah, once again, there's no requirement to use them, but they do offer a lot of good information that will help you with this uh, planning exercise. So uh, we will stay on for until about three o'clock. And if any other questions roll in, we will address them as they come in. Thank you. I'm going to give it about two more minutes here. We'll go to 255. If we don't get anything else, we're going to end the webinar.
Are there any more questions, Ray, or from the SLCP inbox? Nope, nothing that I can see. Uh, if Alexis can double check the SLCP inbox, I think we're good. Oh, Alexis confirmed we are all done. All right, well, thank you so much for attending. If you have any questions uh, regarding the capacity plan after it launches, you can reach out to your land representative or email the slcp.organics uh, email address and we'll get back to you. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Have a great day.